Today, I will be talking about Mary Shelley's The Last Man in connection with our current pandemic of COVID-19. So I'll start by outlining um, Mary Shelley's life, then going through some themes of the novel and then connecting it to our pandemic today. And then last of all, um, there'll be a discussion where people can pose comments or questions about the novel. Mary Shelley was a Romantic era writer most famous for her novel Frankenstein, which recently celebrated its 200th year anniversary in 2018. Mary Shelley was surrounded by many famous writers and thinkers in the Romantic circle, including her husband, the Romantic poet Percy Shelley, and their close friend, Lord Byron, also a Romantic poet. Her father was the highly influential political philosopher William Godwin, who is considered the first modern political anarchist, and her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, who is considered the mother of feminine, feminism through her publication of A Vindication on the Rights of Women in 1792. Written during the French Revolution, influenced by the events such as the Women's March on Versailles, um, many political demonstrations during the time which campaigned for women's rights to property, education, and financial independence. So in recent news, I thought this would be interesting. Um, there's been a recent sculpture of Mary Wollstonecraft, which uh, has caused some scandal and some controversy. As you can see on the left, it's um, and you can compare it to the quotes on the right, which are actually from the vindication. So like she writes, to satisfy the genius of men, women are made systematically voluptuous. This heartless intercourse with the sex deprives both sexes because the taste of man is ventilated and women naturally square their behavior to gratify the taste by which they obtain pleasure and power. So her writing kind of directly contradicts this, um, this representation and yeah, I don't think she would approve very much. Both Mary Shelley's parents' ideas deeply influenced her own writing as the last man grapples with many 19th century political issues that William Godwin advocated and also feminist issues um, that her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote about. Um, Shelley's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft died less than a month after giving birth with her to her um, themes of unnatural birth and unnatural death are abundant in Mary Shelley's texts, such as the unnatural birth of Frankenstein's monster and the sudden deaths from the plague in The Last Man. Mary sometimes identifies with the monster's creation in Frankenstein as she considers herself inadvertently responsible for her mother's death. Um, so Mary Shelley's relationships and family life were often complicated and bittersweet. In 1814, she began a relationship with Percy Shelley, a radical follower of her father, William Godwin, who was already married at the time to Harriet Westbrook. Westbrook. Mary and Percy began meeting each other secretly at her mother's gravesite. That year, they ran off to France together and Mary soon became pregnant. She experienced the first of three miscarriages that year. Um, which left a deep emotional impact on her, and she battled with severe feelings of depression for most of her life. Um, during the time the couple was socially ostracized because of their illegitimate relationship in severe debt and grieving the loss of their unborn daughter. In 1816, she married Percy shortly after his first wife, Harriet, tragically committed suicide. Her father, William Godwin, stopped talking to her completely and estranged her from the family as he strongly disapproved of their relationship, despite his previous friendship and regard with Percy. Notably, William Godwin was an advocate for free love and his own relationship with Mary Wollstonecraft was also illegitimate as she was already married. But nonetheless, he did not carry over the same values in regards to his daughter's relationship. Mary's father only re-entered her life after the success of her novel Frankenstein, as she regained his respect as a writing peer and he became her literary agent. In 1816, Mary Percy, Lord Byron, Clara, Mary's sister, and Dr. John Polidori took a famous trip together to Lake Geneva, which has become somewhat of a legend in romantic history. 
during their stay at the villa, um, they came up with a contest to each write a ghost story. It was during this time that Mary started writing what would become Frankenstein. During this contest, John Polidori wrote The Vampire, the first modern day vampire story in which he based his vampire protagonist on Lord Byron. It's an interesting fact that the first vampire character is based on Lord Byron's eccentric and notorious personality as he kept strange nocturnal hours and numerous exotic pets um, in his home, such as monkeys, badgers, peacocks, goats, crocodiles, and a tame bear while at Cambridge as dogs were not allowed. If you're looking for an interesting film to watch during um, the COVID lockdown, thanks to Alyssa actually, um, I recommend Gothic, which is a 1986 bizarre film about this trip to Lake Geneva. Um, it focuses on the eccentric kind of dynamics of the group and um, definitely hypes up all the rumors and scandalous gossip around the group. It's not really that historically accurate, but definitely can be drug use. Up, but what were you saying? And the drug use, right? Yeah, yeah lots of drug use and uh, <laughs> drug use. Um, yeah, so it's like full of campy, uplifting humor. Um, yeah, so The Last Man was Mary Shelley's fifth novel of a total of seven, published in 1826 during a time of considerable grief and loss in her life. A few years prior, Percy Shelley drowned during a boating accident and her half-sister Fanny Imlay committed suicide. She, was also, she had also experienced three miscarriages and her fourth son, William, died of malaria at the young age of three. Only one of her sons named Percy survived into adulthood. In the 19th century, malaria was a widespread disease that caused mass deaths along with several other epidemics, including smallpox, typhus, yellow fever, scarlet fever, and cholera, which ravaged through the English population. While The Last Man is a work of fiction, England was no stranger to epidemics and pandemics and was constantly fighting deadly illnesses. They thought epidemics were transmitted through the air in what was called miasmas or effluvias of bad air, um, which is how the airborne plague in The Last Man is spread. The number of incurable diseases continued to rise throughout the 19th century with the expansion of the British Emperor into foreign and exotic lands which brought by back deadly illnesses to England and also spread them abroad as they expanded their colonies across the globe. Mary Shelley was writing during a highly virulent time where many common illnesses of today would likely mean death for many as germ theory was not publicly accepted until the 1880s and the antibiotic penicillin would not be discovered until the next century in 1928. Other significant losses during this period for Mary include the death of Lord Byron two years prior to publishing The Last Man, as he died fighting in Greece's War of Independence. In Greece, Lord Byron continues to be recognized as a war hero for his efforts in the Greek fight for independence from the Ottoman Empire, which is a big part of the novel. In 1822, Mary, um, Mary Shelley's marriage to Percy had fallen apart they had separated um, and he was deeply infatuated with a woman named Jane Williams, who he wrote love poems to for the rest of his life. Mary spent most of her relationship with Percy pregnant and grieving her inability to produce a child. Percy was also quite a rampant womanizer and is rumored to also have gone together with Mary's sister, Clara Claremont. And another interesting speculation is that after Percy died, Mary moved to North London to live near Percy's mistress, Jane Williams. And some have kind of speculated whether she might have been a little in love with Jane Williams herself. She also kept Percy Shelley's heart in a drawer after his death, which was discovered upon her own death. Many of Shelley's novels feature autobiographical content, including The Last Man. And the central characters are modeled on important people in her life. The flamboyant character of Lord Raymond who leaves England to fight for the Greeks and dies in Constantinople is clearly based on Lord Byron. The idealistic utopian leader, Adrian, who is both an aristocrat and a political radical, 
is based on Percy Shelley, who benefited a lot from his own aristocratic heritage, which he tried to keep a secret while living as a poor starving artist and radical anarchist. Critical reception to The Last Man during the time of publication was mostly negative as people found the story too pessimistic. Nonetheless, Mary Shelley considered it one of her favorite works that she had written and the novel continues to be ex studied extensively even today. The Last Man was also severely suppressed from circulation at the time. It wasn't until the 1960s that the novel resurfaced for the public as a work of fiction rather than considered a prophecy of the future. With the recent COVID-19 pandemic, this text has become more relevant than ever and is being studied in relation to our own ongoing pandemic. Poems and stories about the last man or the last survivor of humankind were very popular in the early 19th century. Some possible influences on the novel include an 1806 short story um, in French called Le Dernier Home by John Baptist Granville, um, Thomas Campbell's poem, The Last Man, published 1823, which was influenced by Byron's poem, Darkness, written in 1816. The poem, Darkness, is based on an actual event that happened. So there was a volcanic, like a volcanic er eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia in 1960, 16, which resulted in what was called the year without a summer, um, as it drastically altered the weather patterns across the globe. And there was a mass famine around the world, and the sun was blotted out for a while. And um, typhus epidemics rose exponentially that year. So you can kind of see the apocalyptic events that um, influenced Mary Shelley. The concept of extinction was a big topic of debate among scientists and the wider public during the 1700s and 1800s, which culminated with Charles Darwin's origin of the species in 1859. Yet this idea was already being debated long before Darwin's highly influential work, um, as the idea of extinction was already being discussed in 1796. Um, Mary Shelley um, was surrounded in our social circle by many prominent scientists and philosophers and would have been aware of these scientific debates. For instance, Frankenstein was inspired by a scientific conversation between her, Percy, Byron, and Dr. Polidori about galvanism or the generation of electrical current by chemical action in organic bodies, like when the muscles contract and an electrical current comes from the brain. So they were discussing medical discoveries when she wrote her novel. So The Last Man is a three volume novel set in the distant future years between 2070 and 2100. It's written in the first person from the perspective of Lionel Verney. Um, the first volume focuses on Lionel's early childhood, his development into adulthood, the friendships he forms, including the important connection he makes with Adrian, the Earl of Windsor, a wealthy aristocrat who changes Lionel's life by helping him out of poverty and to attain political leadership and higher status. Lionel goes from being an orphan peasant to frequenting in circles of the wealthy elite. While well, set in the distant future, the novel also blurs ancient Greek and Roman history, 19th century issues, along with ideas of what the future might look like. As a 21st century reader, many of the mannerisms, technologies, and politics may seem antiquated, even if the novel is set in the future. Um, the novel takes place in a newly Republican England with elected leaders and a dying monarchy likely inspired by the historical events of the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Mary Shelley's idea of the future is not like other science fiction write, um, novels of the time, such as Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, as her novel features virtually no advancements in technology or machines. Um, in fact, her novel emphasizes the absence of technological development um, and society has become more like the ancient antiquity of Greece and Rome. The people in the future still travel by 19th century horse-drawn carriage. And strangely, hot air balloons are the most modern rapid mode of transportation. 
Social customs are distinctly 19th century and courtship and gender roles are still very traditional. It's possible that Mary Shelley could not fathom how much would be changed by the 21st century, but it is more likely that her future is intentionally antiquated even for readers of her own time, as it draws heavily from the ancient and Greek culture, making it at times seem even more antiquated than the time period that she's writing in. The novel's introduction opens with a frame narrative with a different unnamed narrator who never returns, whose voice could be very well Mary's own. This unnamed narrator describes a trip to a cave of the Cumaean Sibyl, an ancient Roman priestess of the Oracle near modern Naples. In Virgil's Aeneid, the protagonist Aeneas visits the Sibyl to learn how to enter the underworld and return to earth alive. Um, in real life, Mary and Percy Shelley visited Sybil's cave in 1818. In the cave, the narrator discovers the Sibylline leaves, which are written in a foreign language. The narrator explains that the rest of the novel is to be seen as a translation of the ancient prophecy, which presumably discloses the apocalyptic future that's about to unfold. In the year 2070, the Ottoman Empire has regained power and much of the second volume is set in Greece as Athens has been recaptured by the Ottomans. The protagonist Lionel and his friend Lord Raymond both venture off to fight for the Greek army. Much of the second volume focuses on the war abroad as well as the politics back home in England as there is an election for the new position of Lord Proctor. If you're interested in alternate history novels, then this will be a very interesting book for you. The character Lord Raymond represents a char charismatic, war-loving, worldly, natural leader that is adored both at home in England and in Greece through his heroic fighting, much like Lord Byron. Lionel and Raymond fight their way through the Ottoman Empire to recapture Constantinople. But when they arrive, it's a barren city. And then it is then that they realize that they've fallen into a trap. So they have been led to the new hotspot of an airborne plague that has demolished the capital city. The war is quickly brushed aside and there's no enemy left to fight um, when they get to Constantinople. A large majority of the Greek army deserts fleeing in terror as they're faced with a new, more threatening, invisible enemy at this point, the novel shifts from political matters to the pandemic. Lionel returns to England following this anticlimactic victory or loss. It's unclear which it is. And foolishly, he doesn't consider whether he may be infecting the rest of England by returning and bringing it home. So you can see from these quotes, um, this is when they get to Constantinople and it's supposed to be this massive victory of recapturing the city, but when they get there, there's no one there, and they realize that the plague has annihilated everyone, and most of the soldiers run off because they don't want to be killed by the plague rather than the army. So for those that are reading the novel for the plague content, um, don't try to be put off by the first two volumes. The plague becomes the central focus by the, sen the second volume and the third. The first volume may move slowly, but it's important for character development and um, outlining the political climate in England. Um, there's also a crucial reason for this slow development, which is revealed at the end, but I don't really wanna give that away. One possible reason why The Last Man is not as popular or well-known as Frankenstein may be the slow pacing of the first half, which could put off readers who are used to the fast-paced action of Frankenstein, a much quicker and more accessible read. The Last Man is an interesting novel to read during the time of COVID, as there's many parallels to her own times, as well as many striking differences, such as the utter lack of social distancing or quarantining in the novel. Um, when the plague starts to spread in The Last Man, all political debates, as well as the ongoing war, become irrelevant in the face of mass annihilation. The war in Greece suddenly comes to a an halt and no clear winner is chosen as everyone has become a loser to nature's unconquerable plague. While political debates might seem frivolous in the face of possible extinction, strong leadership has become more important than ever. The newly elected Lord Proctor Ryland 
almost immediately abandons his people the moment he hears about the plague and he goes into hiding. He reveals himself to be a coward and incompetent in handling the crisis as he's only interested in saving his own skin. His incompetence is hinted at throughout the novel as he's merely a man of elaborate words. Yet his failure to lead is magnified by the massive task of handling the pandemic that he's ill prepared for. So in her introduction to the um, novel, Anne McWeir, a scholar in romantic literature, writes in 1996 astutely that in The Last Man, the plague functions both metaphorically and literally as dangerous infection can be understood as moral, political, uh, rather than being purely biological. So she quotes, bad political or moral decisions render human beings complicit with the external means of their destruction. So the actions or lack of actions taken by the government and the people can significantly determine the extent of the disease. So it's not just a biological phenomenon. And that's very clear in today's pandemic as well. Um, COVID has become very ideological and politically divided as this biological disease has turned into a matter of right-wing or left-wing politics, right? Um, furthermore, um, she writes that the stagnation of commerce and the economic effects on the lives of ordinary people exacerbate the effects of the plague. Um, so factors such as poverty, um, loss of jobs, differences in financial stability, inequality, the secondary effects are almost as devastating as the virus itself. Another prominent theme is society's denial of the severity of the pandemic and the complete lack of preparation or foresight seen in the novel. England is shown to be in denial rather than proactively preparing for the inevitable split of, spread of the plague, even though they know it has already wiped out entire nations in the East. They read the daily paper about other nations getting annihilated by the plague, and yet they continue on with their normal daily lives as if nothing unusual or catastrophic is happening. The plague in the East is merely a topic of conversation and people cannot fathom it impacting England the plague creeps closer and closer each day as it ravages through Eastern Europe, then Germany, then Italy, France, Spain, closer and closer to home, yet people are still in denial that it can cross the sea and spread to England. The English are completely deluded into thinking the plague can't possibly cross the sea as they're in an island surrounded by an impenetrable barrier of water and distance from the rest of continental Europe but they've forgotten how connected they are to the rest of the world through trade and commerce. Um, being a seaport puts them in constant contact with foreign nations through ships and merchants, right? The British Empire's belief in their own superiority, world power and invincibility blinds them from the possibility of the plague impacting them at all and makes them extremely ill-prepared when the virus finally hits. They view themselves as morally superior to the corrupt Eastern Ottoman Empire. They feel that they are a cleaner and more civilized nations, stronger and more sophisticated, and therefore the plague won't be able to affect them. Nonetheless, the plague is indifferent to power, influence, or wealth. The plague affects all people regardless of their position in society. So there's a bunch of quotes here from the novel. Um, the first one you have Lord Ryland um, saying that the plague is as likely to hit England as the possibility to grow pineapples in England. So he makes it into a joke. And then he focuses on the cleanliness, the morals and the structure of England, which should protect um, them from this um, plague, as well as advising that cleanliness, sobriety and good humor and benevolence are the best medicine. So he's not taking it seriously. Um, similarly, in our own pandemic, in Canada and the US, even in January, as COVID-19 ravaged through Wuhan, China, and we watched the horror unfold on our TVs, we were not able to fully acknowledge and proactively prepare for the inevitable spread of COVID to our own homes. We were largely in a state of denial, carrying on with our daily routines, hoping that because of the physical distance, the virus would not impact our own lives. 
We were genuinely shocked when COVID hit us, even though in our highly globalized and connected world, it should have been no big surprise. The sense of denial as a coping mechanism is still seen today as many people who refuse to wear masks and continue to regard COVID severity as a hoax, attempting to carry on with their lives as if nothing has changed and reacting with hostility towards an uncontrollable situation. In the novel, plague begins merely as a word, an abstract concept and an invisible enemy um, that no one can fathom how much destruction is about to ensue. It's difficult to prepare against an invisible enemy or realize how bad the consequences are going to be until it's too late. Similarly, in our own pandemic, the virus started as an abstract word heard abroad from China, a new coronavirus, another possible SARS outbreak, COVID-19. These are all new words that came into our existence in January, along with other words such as N95, social distancing, PPE, self-quarantine, flattening the curve, anti-masker, words never spoken before this pandemic. In the novel, disease is also associated with foreign bodies and racial others. The plague, much like COVID-19, originates in Eastern Asia. It's first spread through the corrupted Ottoman Empire, which is now the Muslim world, Islamic world, and parts of Africa. The fear of disease and contamination is associated with the fear of being corrupted by exotic and impure influences from the East, whose manners, religions, and habits were regarded by the English as less civilized. It is worth noting that Lionel contracts the plague from the only Black character mentioned in the novel, who is described more like a ghost than a man, and whose Blackness is associated with evil, foreboding, and uncleanliness, racial tropes that were very common in the 19th century literature and culture. This racializing of disease is still seen today in how people, um, some people refer to COVID as the Wuhan or China virus and how the pandemic has caused increased violence against Asians in many parts of the world, including Canada, um, as well as in how the Chinese government have tried to blame the virus on Blacks residing in China, barring them from medical services and trying to evict them from their country, um, along with the increased political unrest in the US currently unfolding, including the death of George Floyd, um, which combined COVID-19 and racial discrimination together. Um, with diseases throughout history, you see that there's often moral, political, and racial prejudices attached to biological um, contagions. So I will really be discussing the outcome of the novel um, for those interested in reading it, such as what happens to Lionel and the rest of humankind. I will point out more broadly that one of the most interesting parts of the novel is when Lionel and Adrian, the new benevolent and caring leader that replaces Ryland, go by carriage and boat across Europe, collecting plague survivors from all different nations in hopes of starting a new civilization. This part of the novel is a blend between an apocalyptic survival story and a travelogue as the text describes the elaborate, beautiful, scenic settings of different European cities, such as France, Switzerland, Rome, Dover, Paris. Notably, all places Mary and Percy Shelley traveled during their relationship together. This novel can be seen as Mary Shelley's elegy to all the important people and memories in her life, as it is a story so heavily focused on death and grief, yet is abundant in the celebration of life and her dearest loved ones. Um, the Beauty of the Landscapes parallels another book she wrote with Percy Shelley called Histories of a Six Weeks Tour Through a Part of France, Switzerland, Germany, and Holland. But instead of cheerful romantic travels around the world, it's now desolate and disease stricken. Nevertheless, the novel shows that nature continues to flourish and grow aplenty even as people are dying. Nature's abundance and beauty, even as humanity is suffering, <clears throat> is a haunting theme in the novel, as animals and plants continue to thrive and are utterly indifferent to the condition of man. Shelley seems to suggest that humans are not the center of the universe and that the world will continue on whether or not we are in it. The great chain of being was a prominent idea in the 19th century from Christian teachings 
which placed man hierarchically under God in terms of importance and having dominion over all other living creatures. Shelley's novel seems to challenge this idea as the earth seems to be doing just fine and the animals even seem to be celebrating man's decline with their newfound freedom. Um, while humans are often regarded as the most superior and advanced species, the novel grapples with how all of man's grand achievements from the Egyptian pyramids, the ancient Greek and Roman temples, great works of literature, art and music, powerful leaders and historical figures are all ultimately meaningless and ephemeral as someday your species will go extinct and no one will be left to appreciate the monuments that we've accumulated. The novel then culminates with the deep existential question, who will be left to read this book if humanity is gone? And what's the purpose of writing or doing anything at all if it matters little in the grand scheme of time? Even if the current plague doesn't wipe out humanity, the narrator has to reconcile with the inevitable extinction of mankind, whether it's caused by the current catastrophe or the one after or the one in thousands of years from now. What's the meaning of Linus life? an orphan peasant who has not made any lasting mark on the earth. What does the future look for Lionel, even if he does manage to survive this all? While writing the novel, Mary Shelley had no idea how big of a legacy she was going to leave behind and how popular Frankenstein would still continue to be, even in 2020. Um, so just going back for a second. So you see some quotes about nature kind of thriving, right? So the one in the middle, plague is the companion of spring, of sunshine and plenty. So instead of kind of a dark horror all the time, you actually get this very beautiful landscape of abundance and nature kind of flourishing regardless. Um, and then deep existential thinking about the loss of man and what his life means. Yet even amidst the doom and the existential questioning, the novel shows how people continue to thrive and find joy amidst constant death and suffering. The denial which prevented England from adequately preparing now becomes an essential coping method for staying positive in hopeless times. People are attending concerts, theaters, and appreciating the arts more than ever. Characters try to spend as much time with their loved ones, enjoying life to the fullest. Romance becomes more intensified and less restricted. Social codes are thrown out the window. People become more caring, charitable, and generous with one another, even if it puts themselves at risk. Characters seem to be appreciating their days more and trying to get as much out of life in the limited time that they have left. The world is the most peaceful it's ever been. Wars have stopped, laws no longer need to exist, and people must self govern as leaders drop down one after the other like flies. Jobs and trade cease, and money becomes meaningless. The world is a massive famine, and everyone's starving, whether rich or poor. So you see here, there's not any social distancing or quarantine in this novel, and that probably goes to the lack of the understanding of how disease is spread. They thought it traveled in the air and if the air was bad um, you were doomed so they didn't really see a reason to self-isolate whereas now we know it spreads through droplets right so yeah um, they say the occupations of life were gone but the amusements remained um, and young lovers kind of threw caution out to the wind it was both a desolate time and a highly decadent time. People were inheriting massive amounts of wealth from deceased relatives. Palaces of kings were empty and peasants were moving in. People were living in luxury for perhaps the first time in their life. England has almost become the anarchist paradise that Mary's father, William Godwin, dreamed of. Except the state of living seems only to be possible at the brink of collapse. It becomes clear why Rome is such a focus of the novel as decadence and the collapse of society seem to go hand in hand together. Lionel and the rest of the people they've gathered spend their days traveling from country to country, marveling at the beautiful scenes of human artifacts and nature that they've never had the opportunity to see before. 
But the lingering question remains, what will happen to Lionel and the travelers? And what does the future of humankind look like in 2100? You'll have to read the novel and find out. For a novel that deals with such a bleak topic, life during the plague is also filled to the brim with beauty, joy, friendship, and long-standing hope even in the darkest of times. So thank you all for listening. And I'll now open up the discussion for questions, comments, or anything else that comes to mind. So I guess you can just kind of talk. OK, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. There's some parallels to a lot of other works that have come since. Um, everything from novels to uh, various episodes and television shows, all kinds of things. I'm noticing parallels to um, a Babylon 5 episode called Confessions and Lamentations. Ooh. It's all about a plague that wipes out pretty much an entire species. There's even parallels to what we see with Chernobyl. Yeah, yeah. Like she really set kind of a foundational text. Um, like she was considered one of the first apocalyptic novels and really kind of set up that genre in many ways, even if people don't realize that the influence comes from this text. Um, I, I guess for me is I, I really like how you pointed out like the, the surprising like lack of technological advances that I guess you made a point to. Yeah, I really felt like the like as i said kind of before i'm only up to chapter six i'm not even on volume two yet but like after i read the first chapter and then the first the second chapter is like 2021 20, and then when that number hit me i was like oh this is about the future for that full just based on the first chapter alone i thought i was reading about victorian era <laughs> Yeah, and I really like that kind of that effect on me when I was reading it. So, yeah, the mannerisms and like the social codes all seem kind of frozen in time, right? Which is kind of funny to read as someone who is in the 20, 2020. Um, but I think, like I said, I think a lot of it's intentionally antiquated, even for her own time, like, um, like the references to the antiquity. But I think she couldn't like to write the future I don't think because she was living within those social codes and like the gender um relationships like I don't think she could have thought of anything different almost in regards to like you know proper etiquette and stuff that we would find very out of date out of place reading now right totally yeah even the language is antiquated but she's writing in the 19th century language right so yeah was she writing to be prophesying the future or reflecting on current politics and concepts i would say a mix of both like she brings in discordant times like she brings in the ancient roman and greek and political issues of England of the time, like the French Revolution and whether the monarchy should be replaced by a Republican elected government. That's a huge issue in the novel. And it seems that the elected government has taken over, but there's also kind of a dying monarchy in the background. So there's contemporary issues. Um, and the fact that it's said in the future also says that not much has changed by 2070. Like they're still fighting the Ottoman Empire, and they're still trying to debate whether the monarchy should go. So it shows a like a long period of no progress, right? Because you're in 2070, and they're still dealing with the debates of the early 1820s, right? So it's like time, nothing has been achieved in Parliament. <laughs> um, in referencing back to ancient times, is she selectively referencing to times where they too had experienced plague and epidemic? Yeah, like the ancient Greeks had a massive plague. Um, I don't know the years by hand, but also like the decline of Rome, which was filled with decadence and kind of 
nonstop like celebration is also paralleled there. Also the setting of Constantinople um, and the fall of Constantinople being referenced, but having a completely different outcome, right? So she's definitely um, t referencing particular time periods within that history. Also, um, yeah. And there, there was the Great Plague of London too, right? Which happened in the 1600s, I think mid 1600s. And there was a big epidemic of plague that spread through London. So just um, a couple lifetimes before her, she might've um, been influenced by that too. Can I ask a question? <laughs> Yeah, so um, first of all, Tiffany, thank you so much for sharing this presentation and um, just sharing these really profound um, parallelisms or, or um, things that have become derivative from this text. I, I actually have two questions. I guess the first is, do you think things like we were talking about, you know, how she's kind of going back to antiquity, how she has this idea of the future being like when the future is actually us going back to antiquity, do you think that these are kind of romanticist, um, this is a very romanticist thing for her to do, and also this idea of like return to nature, like I remember like the fake news happening about like dolphins are coming back to Venice and things yeah. like that, um, so I'm, yeah, I'm wondering like if there were any of those kind of ro romanticist type themes or ideas that come out in the text. The second question is, you mentioned how the text was quite suppressed for a while, until it, it became more popular around the, the 60s. Could you talk a bit more about that suppression? Yes, um, so the first question, during the early 19th century, the glamorization of ancient Rome and the aesthetics and the art and um, the literature from ancient Rome and Greece was a very popular trope that you find in almost all of the romantic poets and writers. Like if you read anything by Percy Shelley, his most famous poem, Ozymandias, is about a fallen leader, I think. Uh, yeah, um, so like the, the romanticization of the antiquity is such a big part of romanticism. So I think she was definitely, um, you know, using that as well in her text and also criticizing the en enlightenment, right? That was a big um, part of the romantic movement was criticizing kind of the logic the logically and empirically reason-driven enlightenment movement and kind of going back to classical mythology and Greek myths and um, art and emotion, going back to that time. Um, so I think there's, an, a, there's a critique on like enlightenment thinking as well and kind of, uh, yeah, like a pastoral going back to the, the ancient idea. Industrialization. <laughs> Yeah, like Lionel spends a lot of time thinking about how great all the Roman sculptures and literature is, right? Like he's just, that's where he wants to be if he's gonna die. He's like, I wanna just see the antiquity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the second question, yeah, about the suppression, I didn't look into it too much, but the reasons I read were because it was too pessimistic um, mm -hmm. and people were treating it as a prophecy. Like I said, it was a very influential because it was one of the first kind of apocalyptic stories and people kind of interpreted as like the future, right? So it was seen as a dangerous text to read until I guess um, the apocalyptic narratives became more prevalent, right? Um, and yeah, I think during her own time, people were also kind of sick of lastness stories like the last man or, um, <laughs> You know, like like people didn't really want to hear about that anymore. So, yeah, it didn't do particularly well in her time. Not because of suppression, but only later it became suppressed because of the ideas. It's worth noting um, for all you somewhat younger folks that in the late fifties through about the early eighties, apocalyptic fiction was huge. And so it's it coming back then is not really surprising because everyone was so worried about getting blown up by a, a nuclear apocalypse. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a kid uh, and a teenager, I read a ton of apocalyptic fiction. It was it was incredibly prominent at the time. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I grew up watching a lot of the old Twilight Zone episodes with my dad. So it's definitely like definitely the last man on earth. Isn't that like the first episode, the guy who finally gets to read all the books because everyone's been blown up. So yeah, with the nuclear weapons, like human apocalypse becomes an idea. Like that's not just an idea. It's a very... Mm-hmm. Um, very immediate reality that's possible right Mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's fairly uh there's another novel some of which i would not be surprised and did not know before this talk is probably somewhat inspired by elements of the last man where uh there's a book i can't remember the name of the author at the moment the book's called on the beach oh i've read yes yeah it's set in australia and in it, there's been a nuclear war that's devastated life in the northern hemisphere, and the, the miasma of nuclear fallout is slowly marching south. And as it gets closer, you see a lot of the same kind of uh, decadence and cele- well, I won't call it celebration, murderous decadence and 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 a nihilistic fever before everyone dies in in. Uh, in the uh, the civilization south of the equator. Hmm. Yeah, I I actually saw that they made a movie out of that with with yeah. fake Australian accents. <laughs> I think um Anthony Perkins was in it and Fred Astaire. I remember in a in a pretty serious role. So yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I I should look in. I should watch that again. That's a good pandemic movie. Yeah, that's a good connection. Um, looking at the legacy that this text has had. I wonder if there will be films or novels kind of based on COVID that will, you know, like, I guess we're not really thinking of this as a mass annihilation at this point, but like kind of, you know, how Hollywood hypes, like it, it's very bad, but you know what I mean? Like the, the mythology that's going to come from COVID-19 in mm-hmm. the future. Mm-hmm. I think it'll be interesting how Hollywood treats COVID because right now I've been reading a lot about television series that are uh, shooting their like seasons right now. And many of the producers of these television series, I believe it was the blacklist, the producers said that they did not want to even touch on COVID during their series, which Mm -hmm. is interesting because it's like happening, the series is supposed to be happening right now. So that's almost a way of denying it, almost a way of saying it didn't happen, right? And I think that it would be really interesting the way our film, television and stuff treat this event in our history. Are we going to deny it? Are we going to admit it happened? And how truthful are we going to be about its impact on the world today? How many people actually died? What it did to economies? And it'll be interesting when it's all done and all the vaccines are, are, are... this first and everything like that what exactly are we gonna look back and learn from this whole experience right I think it's also hard to write a story while you're still in the midst of it unfolding right like it's so unpredictable right now I think if you were to write a narrative now it would be short-sighted and it wouldn't cover like enough right it's hard to know what's gonna happen in a few months or a year or two years from now right and the fact that we have to ask like are people gonna think it's real or not is worrying because in the u.s with trump you have a leader that's constantly saying that it's not real and it's not a big deal right so it's very alarming to have someone with that much influence telling people it's not something to be concerned of like sometimes watching the tv i'm like is this even happening (laughs) like i I think sometimes people also don't really want to see it either when you're when you're in this much turmoil and suffering you want to look at everything else but right the elephant in the room and I think that's where we're seeing all the celebrating in the book is that these are people they don't want to look at the reality straight in the eye they'd rather get drunk and 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 party and do decadent things and stuff because actually sitting down and looking at the elephant in the room is far too terrifying at that present time yeah um, part of the thing that I was talking about is the the idea of an invisible enemy. I think a lot of people don't take it seriously because it is something that you cannot see. 
directly. And I think there needs to be almost more graphic imagery of like the ICU units. What does the patient on the ventilator look like? Like people need to see what COVID is, right? And I think the novel puts you in the head of people who are going through the plague and the symptoms they experience. And like, you know, that's the the horror of the novel, like is you 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 see it, right? Like and like, I think it would be I think it'd be easier easier for us, Tiffany, if we had spots. Like when you got infected, if you had spots or you turned purple or something. But there's nothing really at first with co a lot of people have COVID and they show no symptoms at all, but they're still carriers, right? So like you said, it's invisible. If it was like we got oils on our skin and, and red pock marks and everything, I think it would hit more at home because that's ugly, right? We're looking at something ugly. Right really? now, we're looking at something invisible. And the problem is, is that the people who are on the ventilators are still invisible to us because they're closeted off from us. We, we, yeah. we're, we're not seeing them, right? Everything is in the background, behind the curtain. Don't look behind the curtain. Yeah, people need to see behind the curtain. And I think what was so powerful in Wuhan, China, was the, the, the journalists who went to prison, right? They're still in prison, some of them. The ones that like went into hospitals and they took direct footage of all the dead bodies and the people on ventilators and the hospitals being built. Like that was the imagery that kind of shook us in January, right? And I think we can't be protected from what COVID it actually is, right? Like people need to be scared. I'd like to point out that we are privileged from our economic point of view that we don't see it. But when my sister was trying to get back from Ecuador, there were bodies on the streets. They mm -hmm. were, and the government was not moving to get humans back to our Canadian citizens home. So we are privileged. And I think the book, I found it very interesting that the book references that sense of privilege as the peasants move into the palaces. In looking at real estate real, recently, I'm starting to see speculators being opportunistic um, as people are starting to list their businesses for sale. It'll be interesting to see what happens and if political greed in the face of death still rears its ugly head. Yeah. You know what, you know what I was, because I took years of history, and I always lo would look at the uh, at the history of these great civilizations crumbling. And I always thought, what was it like to be in Rome when it fell? What was it like to be in Constantinople when it was taken over you know, by the Ottoman Empire? What were people thinking in London as people were dropping dead around them? What was life like? Did they just carry on because they had to go to the well and get water? And like, did they just kind of were in such stress and such shock that they just kind of went and got the water, come in the house and just kind of didn't look at anybody, right? Just kind of like do my job and I just got to get this done, right? And you look at what's happening with COVID today and our government, the US government and the, and the impact it's had on economies and governments around the world. And we are actually getting a glimpse of what some of these great civilizations thousands of years ago or hundreds of years ago, what what they must have been thinking and feeling at the time. Yeah, I think um, like the human mind, like the way that the mind responds to trauma is sometimes to normalize it. Um, like if you're faced with a extremely jarring and unpredictable situation, sometimes the brain like often just wants to keep doing what's normal. So it's not surprising that people can't adjust to something that's completely different and new, right? Like, and it's not surprising that there's a lot of kind of protesting and anti-maskers because people don't respond well to change well, right? It's something that's been thrown into people's lives and that's like not saying it's right, but people cope that way because they don't want life to be different. But no matter how you, loudly you yell, COVID's not going away, right? It doesn't care. I'd just like to mention that I strongly resonate with that feeling of in times of stability, people look for like, think about times of instability and be like, oh, that were, those were times of opportunity. But in retrospect, like when, for example, I'm talking with my grandparents about their experiences during the war, as well as like the Japanese ruling era. Oh, sorry, context. I'm Taiwanese, so 
there was some colonization back then and life was very different from what it was now. Like they, they, they would kind of give a, a, an account that's completely different from what I would imagine life back in the day was because you would overlook how much that during that era of instability that how much you just want to get on with your life and just do normal things and mm -hmm. yeah yeah like i was recently watching a documentary about north korea and it in, like it interviewed people who like either were like fleed from north korea and moved to south korea and they were like what was life like it must have been every day must have been you know kind of a horror show of like you know but the, most people said like even though like it was difficult we tried to just keep things normal and watch cartoons whenever possible and just you know do normal things so it shows that even like in the worst situations humans try to make something normal of it or need need their routines just to function Tiffany, have you ever read the play, um, uh, oh, I had it right in my head here. Uh, it's a Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht play, uh, Mother Courage. No, I haven't read very much Brecht. It's interesting because during Mother Courage, that whole idea of people moving in and taking advantage of the destruction that happens and, and the, the corporate greed and, and also the, the desperation of people just to have some sense of normalcy in their day. It's that play is beautiful for expressing that, um, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a good play to read if you're thinking about those sorts of concepts of how people deal with the devastation of their economy and their government and their world around them. Even though there's bombs blowing up all over them, all around them, they're still trying to maintain. Let's go have a breakfast together. Uh, we should probably fry some eggs, um, you know, oh, you're not eating enough, you should eat more sausages, you know, when really the whole world is going to heck in a handbag around them, but they're still concentrating on, you didn't have enough milk, drink a little bit more milk, you know? Yeah, a recent film that kind of deals with this is, um, it's actually kind of a comedy, it's Jojo Rabbit, it won a bunch of Oscar awards last year, and it's about like, World War II, like from the German and like the Jewish perspective, but it's told through the perspective of children. And it's like children amidst like catastrophe and war. And like some of them are child soldiers and they're just trying to do children stuff amidst explosions and everything, right? Or living in hiding as a Jewish person. Like it's just, it just shows like people trying to make something normal out of something that's completely not normal, right? Any more comments or questions? Well, I'm just wondering if as a as a whole, if we as Canadians will have to maybe after this is all over um, and most of the unrest has, has calmed down, if we as a nation will have to just turn around and go, okay, guys, we've got to just now work together to repair all of this and, and, and rebuild and doesn't matter, let's just all work together. And I'm wondering if maybe we'll have so much trauma from what happened that we'll have a difficult time doing that because um, you know, when you suffer from trauma, you, you, you're, you're always making decisions on survival mode, right? And I'm hoping that after COVID is over and the unrest and everything, I'm hoping that we're, we're gonna be able to take a deep breath and sit down and stop making decisions on survival mode yeah yeah what what does that look like the trauma from covid it's probably already happening with all the deaths you know and mental health is probably a huge like issue right now because everyone's isolated and taking in all of this news and not able to process it because the news is changing so rapidly every day right it's like something new every day Slightly looking at, back to the book, um, the the mention of like during the end times, I guess, <laughs> the, it, there was a, you mentioned there, the people actually turned towards the arts and turned towards the 
the the feeling of live today as you actually prefer to and money loses value because no one's t toiling for like just a day's change anymore. And I think in some ways that is kind of beautiful <laughs> that maybe that was the way life was intended to be lived in the first place instead of developing this archaic financial system but <laughs> right like like i mentioned like it's too bad like we can't do that now because we know how covid has spread the airborne virus like um or not airborne i mean droplets so like we can't really just go out and say to heck with it because it affects other people so but yeah the idea like i think for a lot of people um, with the, the amount of like with having the privilege to be able to work from home and not having to worry about finances this can be seen as kind of like a massive break in a way too like for people who are obviously struggling to make ends meet or who have lost jobs they are not thinking that way but from people who can work from home like like me I'm an academic like I recognize the privilege I have to work from home but the change of pace and being able to wake up like at the time you want to and to get a good night's rest and to not be so busy or spending like wasting hours on the subway every day right like that's been a massive kind of breath of relief of not just rushing from place to place all day for work right in general it's some people are you know of course many people those people who are living paycheck to paycheck and had little to no safety net are really struggling. I've been out of work. This is literally the longest period of time I've been out of work in my entire life. Mm -hmm. So we're talking more than, you know, during my work career, more than 40 years. And so it's, it's, but we're doing fine financially. So we're very fortunate. We've been able to make ends meet and everything else, even with me not working, which is bizarre but useful. And it's worth noting that this is still a temporary thing and we have the luxury of knowing that this is temporary. There are vaccines that are being deployed and some of the first ones will actually be deployed within weeks now from the time that we're talking. Mm -hmm. And previously, the fastest a vaccine was ever developed for a new pathogen in human history was four years. We've done this one in under a year, which is an incredible feat of technology and diligence and effort. And it, it, it's an amazing accomplishment as a species that we're able to do this. And it's only because we have this technological advantage that people 200 years ago didn't have that we're able to do this. Yeah, and also like, the money factor too, right? It's almost like the next space race who can get the COVID vaccine, right? It's like economically driven and people want to be the first, right? It's just such a highly competitive field, right? For the field of good, but then there's this world of money and pharmaceuticals that's also involved and in who can make billions off of this vaccine that's coming out. Like it's, it's a testament to the progress of science and being able to develop it this quickly, but also shows like that money can drive progress very fast if there's a lot of money behind it, right? Well, really, it's not even just a matter of money, it's a matter of will. I mean, the money came about because people wanted this and wanted it now, and that made the money available. Money is just, an, it's just a, really just a, a symbol for effort and for will. Okay, are there any other questions or should we wrap up? Well, Tiffany, if you want to wrap up, that'd be great. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful lecture and a great uh, Q&A. And I can't say how much I appreciate the uh, generosity that you showed us tonight of sharing all of the knowledge and sharing this book with us. Uh, well, you know, Tiff, we love you no matter what, but this was a terrific uh, talk and I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. Did a so, great job. So if you'd like to um, mm -hmm. sign off, that's fine. If you'd like to uh, talk a little bit more, that's that's good too. But it, I guess it's up to everybody how they feel. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, um, I guess if there's no more questions, we can wrap up and uh, 
you know, if you have anything else you want to send me, you can uh, message me on Facebook through the group if you think of something. And yeah, thank you all. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you all for attending. And it was like a really interesting discussion to hear from you all. Like it brought in my understanding of the work um, from having this discussion. So thank you all. And thank you. Enjoy the rest. Good night, Tiffany. We'll see you. Good night, everybody. Take care. Stay well, everyone. Wear a mask. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye.